Hello, this is John Greiner with Basin Safety Consulting and Training. This month we're going to be covering noise exposure, hearing conservation, and fatigue management. We have five basic objectives. We're going to learn how hearing is lost, how to avoid hearing loss, what PPE is out there to protect us from hearing loss, then we're going to be covering fatigue factors and impacts, and how to safeguard against fatigue. So, hearing conservation. A few things you need to know. Uh, it's obviously a part of any job, you know, uh, protection uh, is one side of it, but then also conservation because, you know, if you're not conserving what you already have, then what's the point of protecting it? So it, it's employer's job to ensure that employees are adequately protected. That means that they must go out and sound test or, you know, use a decimeter to test areas around the workplace that might be loud or an area where an employee may uh, retain hearing damage. So as an employee, our job is to make good decisions, heed any warning signs, and if it says anything's over 80 decibels, then we know, hey, we need some form of hearing protection. And then the form of hearing protection we use depends on specifically how many decibels we're around and how many or how much time we'll be exposed to it. So the way hearing works is sound enters the ear canal and then causes the eardrum to vibrate. Those sound vibrations move through the ossicles and into the cochlea, and the cells inside the cochlea move and bend, and that's in turned into a neural signal that uh, transmits into you know, a, a logical sound that we can hear and decipher. That's basically what's going on. So it's basically a bunch of bouncing around. Uh, here's a picture of inside of the inner ear, and these cells, or these nerves inside the inner ear, they're a little bit like grass. So if you can imagine an, an excavator moving across a football field, uh, next to a person walking his dog across that same football field, and then next to that, you know, uh, an animal running across that football field. If you're a deer hunter at all, you know that animals moving through a forest or somewhere will eventually wear down the grass and kill it. So will an excavator, uh, just upon one, uh, tr you know, uh, essentially trek across a football field, and a person and his dog will probably make no impact. So if you look at those three as, as sound duration, as sound impact, and then just your regular sound, it's, it's similar to your inner ear. So a loud noise will damage these instantly. You may hear some ringing in your ears from that. Um, and then prolonged, even not extremely loud noises, will also cause an impact to your inner ear and to these nerves. And so, you know, we want to make sure that the levels of sound we experience are low. So types of sounds. Uh, they, sounds have information we are obviously wanted to hear. Um, that information is then transmitted, and we take that information uh, and, and <clears throat> turn it into something that we can use. Sounds measured, the vibration of sound is measured, and we typically use hertz to measure this. So if you, if you look at this here, um, you're seeing pulses and you're also seeing waves. So sound will come in both pulses and waves, and your ear essentially is, is managing both of those at the same time. So hertz is what we hear, decibels is how loud uh, we hear it. So here, for example, an elephant is capable of hearing, in dogs to a certain extent, hearing sounds very low. Humans have a very wide range and certain animals such as bats can hear over 20,000 hertz. So decibels, like I said, is the unit that we use to measure uh, loudness. And that's the general unit that you know, we use uh, across the world. So this is a decimeter here that can actually measure sound. Uh, decimeters are rather expensive, but your phone actually has an app that can measure as well. So here's kind of a, a good chart to show you where different things that we typically encounter fall on the decibel scale. So a lawnmower is gonna be about 80, um, which is where, we, where OSHA requires hearing protection, and us as employers need to provide that hearing protection. Motorcycles, you're up there around 100. Uh, pain threshold's right there about 120, and the rock concert's a little bit cut off there at the top, but that hits about 140. Gunshots are also in that 140 range. So if you've ever been to the gun range, I was there last week, you know, we made sure we had inner ear protection as well as outer ear protection because prolonged exposure to loud noises such as, as gunshots will cause damage. So we want to make sure we're, you know, protecting ourselves. So when noise-induced hearing loss happens, typically it's going to result in tinnitus. And the ways that we protect that here is we first of all want to eliminate anything that's causing loud noises, then substitute. For example, substitution would be uh, an electric motor for 
for a, a gasoline or a diesel powered one. Then we want to provide some sort of engineering controls such as barriers or walls. Administrative controls lastly, as far as a, actually a protection method. Um, so administrative control would be, you know, sign uh, saying, hey, hearing protection required 90 decibels or 85 decibels or 100 decibels or whatever decibel rating uh, that you're working around. And if you're curious, once again, what the level of the sound is or where you're working, you can use your phone, down, down, download an, uh, an app. Mine's called Decibel X. And then lastly, PPE. So we're going to get into elimination here a little bit. Obviously, we want to move things, if we can, um, outside. For, for an example, uh, an air compressor. If you're running an air compressor inside of a shop versus outside of a shop, you're going to have guys exposed to loud noises all day. So that can cause fatigue, and we'll talk about that as well as obviously hearing damage. So you can also shut equipment off when people are working if you can't move it away. Substituting, I mentioned electric motors here. That's obviously that they're typically quieter. Uh, combustion motors are typically louder. So changing those out or pneumatic tools for electric tools is one way to um, protect people. Engineering controls, as I mentioned, barriers, dampeners, mufflers, bafflers, um, those sorts of things are, are designed to go around the sound to protect people. Those would be our engineering control methods. Administrative controls, they're not a, a true um, safety measure, they're just a warning sign. You know, hey, uh, they're, they're, you need hearing protection, and this is why, and then you put that in the area where people will be working. So if you can't do anything else, or if you ran out of you know, all, all your options, then PPE uh, is, is the option. You've heard this, heard this covered many times by me in these meetings, that PPE is the very, very, very final line of defense. So going over PPE real quick here. Earplugs are obviously the most common type. Uh, they have different models of earplugs. Uh, they have the roll down foam. You can't just smash those in and we'll go over that here shortly. And then my favorite are the reusable kind. Just makes a lot of sense. They typically work well and you can clean them, use them again, put them in, you know, I use a little 3M, uh, like a cap um, a deal that, that I put it inside of. And then I can use them multiple times. So the way that you insert them is you roll them tightly, you open up your ear canal either by pulling down on your lobe or pulling up on your upper ear, insert it, and you let it open up. Now it's gonna take a few seconds to really fill in uh, once, it, uh, once it becomes unrolled, and, but that's how you use it. Now obviously this is a problem for, uh, for us is uh, the, the ear wax and things that can get on there. So you know if you're using reusables, then you know, get rid of them after, after, they, uh, after they've been used. Now, those can be and typically will be used in conjunction with earmuffs. And this is an example of some earmuffs here. You know, if you've used these before, you, you, you understand. Um, I like to use them, especially like, as I mentioned, on the gun range or if I'm working around loud noises, concerts, etc. You put the inner ear ones and then you put the earmuffs on. Probably not going to get a lot of points uh, or cool points wearing earmuffs at a, at a rock concert, but hey, you know, if you want to protect your, your hearing, then, you know, you can, you can find the right kind. They also have ones now that are actually designed for, for example, hunting, where you can put them in there, and they're going to impact your noise reduction rating. So they're going to be designed to prevent certain levels of decibels from impacting your ear at different frequencies. So the noise reduction rating is kind of a goofy uh, numerical system here, but essentially what, what they've designed is a method to determine how many decibels your hearing protection will protect you from. But you can't take it at face value. The 12 and the 26 here are actually halved, so it's actually six per ear for the 12 and 13 per ear for the 26. So if you're around a 95 decibel um, situation and you have a 26 decibel NRR and you're only allowed to be around 80 decibels, you take your 80 plus your, you know, that half number, which would be 13, that puts you up to 93 per ear. So if you have a 26 rated NRR, then that's only good for 93 decibels of protection for an eight hour period. And that's another thing. It's not just about the loudness, it's also about the duration of the exposure. So I don't know why they're still using that system. It's a little confusing, but you do have to do that calculation of 50% in order to get the, the proper protection that you're gonna experience. And as I said, they have different models you can get specifically designed for your workplace, which is, which is pretty great. So, you know, using these in conjunction and protecting yourself is what we wanna do. 
So now we're gonna get into fatigue management. Um, like hearing protection, you know, you have a lot of control over your personal experience with whether or not you're gonna protect yourself. You know, I, I'm not gonna go check each of my guys, you know, hearing protection based on the NRR. I'm gonna provide the proper hearing protection and hoping that they, and hope that they um, understand that after having trained them because every day, every moment, they're gonna be in and out of areas where they need hearing protection. Fatigue management is similar where, you know, I don't know how much rest my guys are getting at home. You know, I typically don't, you know, come over after hours, look in the window with binoculars and see how, you know, if they're getting a, a solid eight hours of rest. Um, and some people, and we'll talk about this, it's not even about trying, you know, they may want eight hours of rest, but maybe they're ill. Maybe they have kids at home that are keeping them up. Maybe they have some stress that's keeping them from being able to sleep. And that will impact their safety and health in the workplace. So because of that, because fatigue can have such an impact, that's why this training has been put together. We want to make sure um, employees are thinking about, hey, you know, uh, if I'm not getting enough sleep or if I'm extremely stressed and I'm fatigued at work and I'm in a, in a safety critical job where other people can get hurt, if I'm not 100% alert and on point, then we need to talk about it and figure out a, a solution and a strategy. And so that's really why we put it together, uh, why it has been put together is to start a dialogue on what fatigue is, how to talk about it in the workplace, and as employers and employees, create that dialogue and make sure that it's going somewhere. Typically, if, if a worker comes to work and says, hey, you know, boss, you know, I'm just, uh, stayed up real late last night playing video games and I, I'm tired today, so I don't really wanna work hard or I don't really wanna do this, this job. You know, the employers aren't going to be super friendly about that information. But that's not typically the case, even though that is kind of what comes to mind if someone were to come and say, hey, I'm fatigued, I can't work. We're thinking, well, why'd you stay up so late last night? You know, are you out there playing games or, you know, drinking too much or what's going on? But candidly, a lot of workers um, struggle with uh, sleep disorders and anxiety, uh, insomnia. And maybe, like I said, you have kids at home or other things that are keeping you from being alert. And what I'm suggesting here is that we talk about that and we, we put it out there uh, for discussion, especially if you're in a safety critical position. So fatigue is obviously a feeling of tiredness or exhaustion. It can be physical, it can be mental. It's a message to the body or from the body to rest. And it can be aggravated, aggravated by an acute lack of sleep or accumulated sleep debt, not getting sleep over time. So the effects of this, um, can be widespread. Uh, you can have fogginess in your vision, uh, fogginess in your mind, slowed reflexes and reactions, um, micro sleeping while driving, for example, and also automatic behavior. If you've ever been on a road trip or something at the end of a long road trip and don't really remember the last hour, that's an example of fatigue or micro sleep slash automatic behavior. So some other uh, effects, as I mentioned, inability to make wise decisions or plans, solve problems or maintain concentration, You'll have a decrease in alertness and awareness, which makes sense, and inability to remember recent actions or observations. If you guys remember the Prudhoe Bay spill in Alaska in the 80s, which was kind of a, you know, a huge black mark on the oil and gas industry in general, that was a, a result of, of fatigue as they did the incident investigation. They determined that the gentleman that, that uh, was supposed to be watching wasn't, and part of the reason was because he was fatigued. So increased mistakes, we talked about that. If you have somebody who's making a lot of mistakes at work, inability to respond efficiently, uh, inability to communicate effectively, decreased ability to handle stress appropriately, as well as dramatic mood swings. People are gonna experience being impatient, bored, restless, grouchy at work. You know? So when you see these things, maybe that the person's a jerk, or maybe that they're suffering some, from some fatigue. These people are typically also more often sick or absent, or late to work, they resign from positions more often, uh, have a higher turnover, and cause or are involved in more accidents. <clears throat> so these are behaviors you can see exhibited uh, at work. They may work slower, need uh, to double check more often, rely heavily on coworkers, or just totally avoid complex and difficult tasks. Some of the causes, uh, you have individual health and stress, workplace safety culture can play a role, scheduling, project type and length and workplace conditions. We're gonna get into these a little bit, but you know, this is where I mentioned earlier, it's difficult for an employer 
um, or even a fellow employee to determine whether or not, you know, your coworker is just not getting enough sleep or it's not focused on the job or is thinking about, you know, his family back home and he's working far away from, from home and his family. But all these things, they have an impact. We can't just say, well, just suck it up, buttercup. You know, don't, don't miss your family and, and focus on the job. I mean, that may have been the case 20 years ago, but now we know that no matter what you tell somebody, you know, they're going to kind of do what they're going to do in their mind. So especially in safety critical positions, it's extremely important that we are watching out for each other and being honest with ourselves and our coworkers if we are experiencing any sort of emotional stress, physical stress, tiredness. Like I said, it could be something as simple as your kids being sick for, you know, six months at a time, or maybe you got a bunch of kids and it's cold after cold after cold and they're up all night keeping you up. You just got to communicate those things. So scheduling as well. If anyone's ever uh, worked a swing shift, you know what this is like. Um, you know, days to nights and nights to days, it can definitely affect uh, your level of restedness or fatigue. Having fixed schedules, you know, we definitely want to contemplate doing that. Shift rotations can affect these. Number of days off. I talked to a guy last night, actually. Um, he worked, I think it was uh, 64 straight days before he had a day off. And, you know, that's, that's I'm sure the money is nice, but over time, how, how does your body adjust to that? And so, obviously, we want to work with our people to make sure that we're scheduling as managers uh, in such a way that um, identifies, you know, does this fit their schedule? Are we giving people enough breaks? Are we giving people enough travel time? And are we understanding that travel time is a, um, is a function of um, our, you know, our day-to-day -day work life? You can't just say that uh, because they're, you know, they're traveling, that that doesn't count towards their work day if they're in the car. That, that's work time and, and it, long long periods of travel bolted on the front end or the back end of a day have an impact. Also some time zone changes if you know, you're know you coming in and out of mountain time in our case, which is typical, that can have an impact. So project type and length also, are we doing a task that's boring and repetitive or complex and mentally challenging? Both of these can cause mental fatigue, especially if it's a job that's done you know for weeks or months at a time with no breaks or minimum breaks or no days off, you know, these sorts of things can have an impact. And so, and you know, as a, as a, as a supervisor, and this is really who I'm talking to here, you know, watch your guys. If, if, if they're in, e if they're typically doing either of these types of tasks and as an employee, you know, if you are involved in these tasks, watch yourself, notice whether or not you're, you know, you're staying as alert as you need to. Some other workplace conditions that can promote or, or um, take away from fatigue. Uh, workplace uh, conditions such as environmental factors, heat and cold, weather. We talked about noise earlier, which kind of feeds perfectly into the, the hearing conservation. Lots of noise can cause fatigue, actually. And I mentioned homesickness earlier, just kind of briefly. Not a, not a super uh, popular topic in the oil and gas industry. You know, if, if a roughneck came up to me and said, hey, boss, you know, I'm, uh, I'm homesick. I'm, I'm not working hard because I'm homesick. You know, uh, I'm, I'm going to be honest, even though I'm doing this training, the first thought in my head would be like, are you really or are you just saying that? You know, we're like, once again, buck up, buttercup, like figure it out. You know, we're all adults here. We got to, you know, we got to run, go with the times. You're here working. Uh, but that doesn't, the challenge there is just, that's maybe the way that, we should think or that we want people to think, but the reality is, is that being away from home home for extended periods of time uh, without seeing your family, without kind of having that cultural network can have an impact on a person's psyche and, and their level of fatigue. So that's something we can't just completely, you know, um, completely pretend doesn't exist, uh, even though in the oil and gas industry, once again, that's pretty common for us to just say, hey, you know, that's not a real thing. Or, or that's just an excuse to drop something out of work should be focused on. You should just be focused on the work. So some ways to reduce fatigue, as I mentioned. So workplace you know, conditions. We mentioned uh, environments that, that well, uh, and encourage alertness, yeah. having engineering and administrative controls that protect people from um, you know, having to work extra hard or additionally hard. So basically working smarter, not harder. And then providing sufficient resources, personnel, and equipment. Now that's nice and easy to say. You know, hey, you should always have enough guys so no one has to work extra hours. You know, once again, this is, I recognize that that's, that's a little bit of a challenge. So, um, as supervisors, how do we promote individual health uh, 
positive conditions, long-term diabetes and, and hypertension, and then short-term cold allergies. How do we interact with those and, and make sure as supervisors that we're taking care of our people? You have to know your people. You know, if, if you're not watching your guys and not uh, not really knowing about what, what physical issues that they have, then there's probably going to be people struggling with fatigue and you have no idea. As well as, and we know this, medications can have an impact um, over the counter or prescription. Um, medical treatments that people are getting or, you know, if people have sleep disorders, you know, and I typically don't ask in an interview process, do you have any sleep disorders that we should be concerned about? But, you know, when, when people do have sleep disorders and we've had people work for us that have, that, that have suffered from these, you know, their productivity is, is pretty poor and it's not because they don't want to work hard, not because they don't have the skills or abilities, but their mind just is not with it each day. So once again, as supervisors, we want to be knowing our people, um, being able to identify those things. And as employees, if we have, you know, if, if we're taking medication that's affecting us, if we're receiving medical treatment or have a sleep disorder, you have to communicate it. You don't want to keep that, you know, under the rug and then hope that no one finds out because eventually they're going to find out. The challenge is, is you know, once again, getting help uh, in these areas as soon as possible rather than just being like, ah, it'll be okay. You know, if, if you've struggled with, with getting enough sleep, um, for, you know, more than a couple months, that's not, that's not normal. You know, that's something that you definitely want to get help with. And other things can affect you too. Alcohol, um, it's definitely, even though people fall asleep earlier, um, they don't necessarily get the, the, you know, get good sleep. So alcohol can negatively impact your ability to sleep well also. So definitely know yourself and know each other. So stress, once again, depending on what it is, if you've got, you know, issues at home, um, you know, if you're having family trouble, if you have a sick family member, um, these things can have an impact. So you have physical health, mental health, and also emotional health. All these things together can combine to cause some pretty serious issues. Um, and then, you know, once again, issues at, at work or home, those stress levels can impact people's ability to, to get enough rest. And so once again, it's difficult to really nail down, um, or take a wide brush and just say everybody, you know, is affected in this way because everybody is dealing with different things and is a little bit different. So chest pain can be a symptom of stress, severe headaches, um, insomnia, indigestion, uh, substance abuse, weight change, mental health, um, all these different things can impact, um, it can have an impact on, on an individual. And once again, if you're struggling with this stuff and if it's just feels like it's prolonged and, and you're stuck there, um, I definitely recommend um, seeking help with, within your company. So, you know, as managers, again, kind of speaking to the management team here and supervisors, us not rewarding productivity over health and safety is, is a big help. Also, you know, stressing the importance of fatigue management, and making sure you're getting enough rest or communicating if you're not for some reason. And then obviously encouraging people when they're doing a good job and any incentive programs that we have should not contribute to fatigue. For example, hey, if, if you guys can work 50 hours of uh, overtime this week without leaning, then you're gonna get a bonus or something along those lines. That's not the, the way, that's not the direction that we wanna go. We wanna encourage people to, you know, kinda have a good work-life balance. And obviously there's times where we have to ramp up and do a lot more work and hey, we're just gonna have to trudge through it. But if that's extended over long periods of time, and you see drop-offs in productivity, efficiency, um, attention, um, focus, et cetera, then you kind of know where to point the blame. You know, typically we want to blame the workers for, you know, you know not being um, on top of their game or, you know, not paying attention well enough. But, you know, stress and fatigue, um, personal issues, and, you know, sleeping disorders, uh, alcohol, the types of food we eat, all these different things can have an impact. So, you know, I want to say this is a little bit of a soft science when it comes to safety and health. And it's not just like here in conservation, you know, the way that an individual um, approaches it makes all the difference. You know, if I'm like, ah, I don't need, my hearing's going to be fine. I don't need to worry about that hearing protection. Well, no one's really going to know how that's impacting you because only you're going to know that. And unlike, you know, hearing protection where you can get an audiogram you know, fatigue, there's no like test where you can determine, you know, whether or not you're, you're tired or not. So that's all we have for this month. Um, you know, obviously we don't want to penalize workers that need rest or fatigue. Um, we want to encourage workers to report fatigue or lack of mental focus to supervisors and supervisors. You know, what are you supposed to do here? If you don't have a plan right now, I recommend 
putting one together. Hey, if we have somebody who comes to us with this, what is our appropriate response? Is it, hey, you know, take a couple days, you know, go rest and relax? Is it take a week off, you know, uh, especially if they're in safety sensitive positions? So thank you very much for uh, staying in tune this week. Uh, please answer the questions and give us some feedback. You know, if, if, there, if you'd like to see more videos in this or more interesting material, let us know. We definitely want to make sure that we're providing you with the highest quality training we can. So thank you very much and have a great month.